Right out, we are starting the recording. Neville Mitchell. How did the Mitchell Airways get formed in the first place? What brought, a, brought about this? Well, this goes back, I'll say, till um, straight after the war, when um, my brother and myself, we, uh, we were working in uh, Mascot, working at Mascot Sydney and the opportunity came up for us to uh, come to Cairns which we did in a gypsy moth and we had all our worldly possessions packed in a, a three by one and a half little cabinet in the back of the uh, moth and we came up to originally work for um, Bob Bolton Bob put the money up and uh, he was money we, we started the what the what was then the uh, Cairns Flying Service and we continued on with that and Bob decided to um, he'd had enough to get rid of the aeroplanes and uh, they were all dispatched to different parts of the country and then uh, after that the, um, that, that, that came to an end, Cairns Flying Service came to an end and then uh, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just have to think a bit here. Uh, could you just, just turn it off, could you cut it out? Well I'll throw a question in. You, you said you came up from Mascot. Um, before the war a Stinson aircraft crashed in the McDonnell Ranges near the New South Wales-Queensland border. And in those days, there was one hangar on Mascot Aerodrome. Uh, to my knowledge, I think the Southern Cross and um, the Faithful and those things used to park in there. What was the size of Mascot in relation to aircraft and hangars when you left to come up here? Oh, it, 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 was, a, it was a fairly... Uh it, it was a fair size. They were only operating um, uh, DC-3s. That was the commercial airline, and the overseas airlines was the uh, Lancastrians and the Constellations. They, they, they were the um, airlines operating out of us, out of Mascot at this time. Mm. And um, the, the chap we were working for at that time was Sid Marshall. He was a, one of the original pilots of Guinea Airways in New Guinea, which we were there, or well, Frank and I were there at, when Guinea Airways were operating, and that's where we got the bug for flying, uh, I suppose. Frank got it for engineering, and I sort of got it from to fly. And Mitchell Airways was formed in Cairns? It was formed in Cairns from... Um, uh, it was formed from a complex sort of a business that uh, when the Cairns Flying Service finished up, we started the Aero Club. There was not myself, you can't, when I say that, I, whenever I say anything about myself, there are lots of people behind what I say. Mm -hmm. So we started the Aero Club up with, with uh, aeroplanes that were bought. They were all wrapped around trees and crashed and everything like that and we purchased these aeroplanes and Frank being the engineer we built the aeroplanes and got the aero club as this stands today the North Queensland Aero Club going and from there Mitchell Aerial Services came into being we had the uh, we had an old wacker trainer And uh, the, while, while the Aero Club was processing, we bought a, uh, the Aero Club bought a, um, an Oster, Oster Auto car. And uh, we couldn't, we, uh, the, we attempted to um, start a charter service with the auto car 
by having members, becoming members of the Aero Club to enable them to get cheap charter by becoming a member of the Aero Club. They could get the Aero Club machine at club rates, but somebody stepped in there and uh, wrote to the government and stopped it. So then we decided to form MAS, Mutual Aerial Services, and we procured the Oster from the Aero Club in exchange for the Wacket, and I think we had another uh, a Tiger Moth, which we transferred to the Aero Club in exchange for the Oster Auto Car, and that was the beginning of Mitchell Aerial Services. And how many aircraft did you have then? One. Right. That was Mitchell Aerial Services. And then... Um, how many pilots? Well, there was only myself mm. as the pilot. But as I say, it's not only me that there was... Well, I was the only uh, instructor in the Aero Club, and I would say at that stage of the game, I was the only pilot in Mitchell Aero Services. And things developed a little bit, and uh, we procured a proctor from Mrs... Uh, Mrs. Innes at Richmond, Richmond Down somewhere. And then uh, we started to employ pilots, which was Peter Curran, Graham Tanner, came into it. And then we procured the, uh, we uh, procured a dragon from New Guinea, which was ferried down by myself and a few other fellows, which was quite a hazardous trip and we're lucky to be here as a matter of fact because the, and if any old pilot of New Guinea is listening we came out from Garofa to Cairns to Garofa to the coast of the south coast of New Guinea at 6,000 feet and I don't think it's ever been done and I don't think it ever will be done again and that was that gave us a dragon and the Osterwater car and then from then we we progressed and uh, we bought a uh, Cessna 180 and then um, an Aztec, that was the first twin engine commercial aircraft operated by a com commercial operator out of Cairns this, at this time and then also a, a Piper Comanche, which was then one of the fastest single engine aircraft in the business, with tractor wonder cars and so forth. And then we, from there we, we just carried on. There was Lionel Jeffries, the pilot, Graham Tanner, Peter Cohen, myself. And then we, uh, we had our difficulties, we found things going <laughs> a bit tough. And uh, Did you have aerial services through the peninsula or were you on charter business mainly? We, we operated the Dragon from, uh, from Cairns to Georgetown, Croydon and Normanton on a, on a reasonably regular basis which was a little bit contrary to the regulations but Nobody seemed to worry. We weren't doing anybody any damage or anything like that. And then we applied for and got the mail contracts for uh, the Chiligo, Rotten Park, Georgetown, uh, Spring Creek, all through there, and as far as Cohen. And from Cohen, Nicky Finn. He was still running the um, the the, the, uh, the mail by pack horse. I saw Mickey Finn one day in car and, and suggested that we uh, would he like to sell it. And Mick said, "Yeah." He said, "I'll sell it to you." So we bought bought the mail run from Cohen. I think it was. Um, I'm not too sure, I think it was in Batavia Downs, Morton, I think Maluna. And uh, the deal was settled and 
we carried on them, and then the mail eventually uh, proceeded. It built up, and then we did the weeper, aracoon, all through there, roping, cone, right through to Cairns. Many stations in between, Musgrave, which is a which a home for home for all pilots. No mum, mum Hales. She was a mother of a lot of us. And old Jim, with his um, rum and port. He was always there to give you a hand if you got caught in weather or anything like that. And Mitchell Airway Services continued to flourish, but we had troubles. Money troubles, liquidity of money, which was owed to us. Well, you, you couldn't get in those days. You didn't worry about it. You didn't get it. You couldn't pay your bills. So the time came we had to merge, and uh, we merged with Bush Pilots. And from then on, it was Bush Pilots. And that's my career finished with MIS and the Aero Club. And went to, with Bush Pilot, up to um, 1968. You had a brother who was a pilot also? Frank, yes, he was a um, qualified engineer and also a very, he did some exceptional jobs by flying Tiger Moths. Tiger Moth aircraft, if anybody, any one of us got into trouble or had engine trouble or anything like that, Frank used to fly the Tiger Moth out to any spot in um, the peninsula and Cape York, and Cape York Peninsula, which was no mean feat for a, a more or less an amateur pilot. Mm. And he did some marvellous feats of getting to get the aircraft going. I suppose there would be occasions that you had breakdowns that it kept you in remote areas for a couple of days and you wondered how you were going to get out? Oh, quite often. But uh, you always realised that the, uh, the Royal Flying Doctor Service was there. Well, at, not at that time, it was the Cairns Area Ambulance and all you had to do was get on the, on the blower and call up... I, I forget the uh, call sign now. Call up the ambulance centre and they'd get a message to the appropriate person, which was Frank, or the next couple next day or so, the airplane would be out there and you'd be fixed up and on your way. Did you ever have any experiences of um, losing power and making false landings? Oh, I had quite a few, uh, quite a few scares, I mean, things that... None unusual. None stick out more in your mind than others? Well, as I say, this bringing the dragon out from New Guinea, from hmm. Garoka to uh, the south coast of New Guinea, was no <laughs> no piece of cake. And there's another time... Uh, Could you go deeper yeah. into that when you say it's no piece of cake? You know, people listening to this tape recording wouldn't appreciate uh, what experiences you went through. You, you're flying at treetop level or...? Well, it's, it's not a case of... Um, treetop level in New Guinea, it's a case of mountains one side of you and valleys below you and mountains the other mm. side and you either go in or you don't and once you go in you're totally committed mm. and there's no such thing as turning back. Once you uh, make the decision to go, that's it, you go, irrespective of what happens on the other side. Because you've got a jungle? Well, it's, you're above cloud, it's, oh. we come out on this side of the uh, on the southern side of New Guinea, and you, you're above the cloud, and you, there's no way back. You just can't go back. And you've got to keep going forward. What about the landing strips in the early days? They, um, some of them, would you consider dangerous and difficult? Oh, quite a number of them. Quite a number of them. Yes. Oh, yeah. But uh, there's one thing that's always sticks in my mind that. Uh, I did quite a few jobs that I thought went into places that, um, that I thought, well, 
That's a good job, Renner. You're pretty good, you know, you're not too bad. But then uh, some silly bastard would come up and say, well, look here, uh, Tommy McDonald did this in 1930-something like that, and that just knocked you right back on your backside. <laughs> and um, that, 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 that's the way it goes. You got my promise we won't cut that piece out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was very really good. Real Australian. Um, what, what did you do when, after the merger with Bush Pilots? Did you give up flying and go into something else? No, I continued on with Bush Pilots and um, I had my ups and downs with them. I, um, I tried to bring in things that I thought should be bought in. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, it's not very hard. To, it's very hard to put it. But um, we were asked to uh, do things that quite weren't quite within the um, in the um, in the law as far as the uh, aviation set the laws down, and they had to be carried out. And Sometimes things happen that um, you are asked to break the well, well I don't know, air navigation orders, they were laid down and that was the law of flying and you were supposed to stick to them and if you didn't stick to them it's just the same as getting out and driving your car without being registered or driving under the influence or something like that. Mm. And quite often this happened, which we did, because things weren't, it was a hard battle to make a quid, as they put it. But I, uh, I think I uh, brought the wrath of the upper echelon down on me quite a few times, because I stuck up for the, the pilots mm. and what they could do and what they couldn't do. All right. What about seasonal conditions? Did you have, did you have to uh, make uh, supply runs in times of flood and, and in times of drought? Did you? Oh yes, quite often. Quite often we had the only way in was by light aircraft, and then again, light aircraft. There are light aircraft and extra light aircraft and the Tiger Moth itself proved an excellent uh, machine. It, uh, it was the only aeroplane that was possible to get into a lot of strips and during the polio epidemic it was the only aeroplane possible to get in and out of anything to get the person out and possibly save a life. How long was that polio e epidemic um, in the area? Oh, it's such a long while ago and time dims the memory a little bit, but oh, I'd say we cover a period of, um, from what I remember, six, six months, I suppose. Oh. Keep you busy. Oh, well, uh, there's plenty of weather there that normally you wouldn't um, you wouldn't try it. You, you would, uh, but you realised that there was this epidemic, and uh, you sort of pushed yourself a little bit and pushed the aircraft a little bit more than sometimes what it should do. But as luck happened, nobody got hurt. And quite possibly, uh, a lot of people were relieved. A lot of pain and life probably. You would have made drops of uh, medical supplies with uh, small parachutes and things like that? Not parachutes, just um, wrap it up in, wrap it up in, in, in something that's, that, would, that would absorb the impact. I mean... Uh, that was successful? Oh yes, quite successful. Sometimes they'd, uh, sometimes they might break, but I can remember 
The rum will never break in a bottle of bread, I know that, because we had quite a few of these in the... Uh, from there, we were operating out of Normanton there, we had, you get the call over, they're flying doctor service. Could you bring a bottle of rum out or something like that? So we used to wrap it up and put it in the bread, hollow the bread out and throw it down. And I don't think there was quite too many bottles busted. More drunk than busted, I think. What height would you drop them from? Oh, get in. See the whites of their eyes, I suppose. <laughs> you, uh... How many years did you have in that environment? All together, I suppose, uh... Well, I, I first became interested in aviation, I suppose, in about 19... Well, I was going to... Didn't my junior or matric senior, 1936. 1933, 1933, right up to the, the, the beginning of the war, we used to, uh, brother and I, we, we used to do this... Um, mucking around in, the, in, New, in New South Wales, selling tickets for joyriding, and uh, I never fly, I wasn't flying, but I used to get the occasional go at the joystick, and, uh, but we used to have quite a lot of good fun getting around New South Wales with the, the old pilot, Sid Marshall. I, I forgot quite a few of the names. I had the pleasure of um, shaking hands with Kingsford Smith. Nancy Bird. Alan. No, not Nancy Bird. Alan, Tommy Petherbridge. Mm. Quite a few of the old fellows. And then the war came. We just signed a piece of paper. Did our bit. Didn't do much. Where, did, where were you in the war? In the, the Air Force? War. In the Air Force. But when they asked me those questions, I, uh, I just say I signed a piece of paper to serve the king and country and did it to the best of my ability. Tell what I was going to what I was asked to do, I did. And then we came out. And from then on, I started this, we started our career. Well, I started my career. I came to Cairns, as I said before. Frank and I, we decided that uh, we'd get out. And just sort of keep going. Get our first job and keep going. And both of us got as far as Cairns, and that was it. We both got married. Frank married his girl he knew in Sydney and I got to Cairns and married Blanche, Blanche Watkins. And that was the, uh, we just carried on from there. Oh, I, after the, uh, after uh, the Cairns flying service went down, I, uh, I went to uh, New Guinea with a chap named Ben Hall. He was a, uh, plantation manager and we flew an old Lanson up from up from uh, very very Frank and I. I was the pilot, Frank engineer and there were no radios, no no aids, no nothing like like they have today and we set off from Horn Island, I can remember this very plainly. And we going direct from Horn Island to Port Moresby. And uh, I don't know, halfway across we were in just pretty bad weather. <laughs> and uh, Frank, I've always often cursed him for this. He leaned over and he tested the switches on the motor, and one motor just about jumped out of the out of the wing. And I sort of the words that were said then I wouldn't like to put over this thing. And, they not to touch anything again sort of business and we had quite a few bad times there and uh, I decided well something wrong so I had a due north and we must hit New Guinea somewhere and we just, had a, we just kept on going north and hit the coast and then uh, turned east knew he must hit Port Moresby and we continued on to, to Port Moresby. And that was the beginning of uh, the stint with Ben Hall, which was very interesting. 
Ben was a very he was a good character. He was a, he was a coast watcher during the war. Had a very distinguished career, Ben. He finally finished up flying a little um, Victor from his plantation in New Guinea. He came down through Cairns when we met. It was pretty, it was pretty bad weather at the time. And Ben came and asked me for, for some advice and I told him. I said, well, yeah, it's better to go inland on this type of weather. And I said, but if you go down the coast, I said, you'll probably get to Hinchinbrook, and I said, you can either go inside or outside. He said, which way is the best way to go? And I said, it depends on conditions. And uh, Ben must have taken the wrong way because they, uh, they found him later on. He killed himself. He must have just went straight in, you know. Bad weather, he just must have flown straight into the water. But they eventually found him. found part of his aeroplane. I don't think they ever found Ben. But... And from then on, I... Well, I went to Qantas. I was flying um, dragons in Qantas, in New Guinea. I had quite a few experiences on them. They weren't easy to fly in New Guinea. Quite a number of strips. You, you once you committed yourself to uh, to an approach, that was it. There was no coming out or getting back. That taught me a lot of. It taught me quite a deal about making sure of what you're doing. You don't get a second chance. And from the Dragons, we went to the DC-3s. And by this time, the uh, well, of course, the DC-3s, they, they had radio. You had, you had radio communications with, with uh, various points, lay. Port Moresby and some of them had what the, the NDB beacons which which made it quite a little bit more pleasant to fly because well you knew that you could you tune into an NDB beacon you get where you're going to go and they still had quite some hairy experiences with weather and so forth. The DC-3 was quite a remarkable aircraft, wasn't it? Well, it, it still is. It's, uh, it'd be one of the uh, most docile aeroplanes that I suppose it was ever built. Mm. If anything was going to happen, it would kick you in the pants about two or three days before you and say, look, something's going to happen here, you better do something about it. And if you didn't do something about it, then well, you were just asking for trouble. Mm. These DC-3s we have here in Cairns today, do you fly any of those? I'd say I would. i say uh, I don't know for sure, but I think the one sticking up on the... Uh, on the pylon at on the, the International the, Airport. I think that was uh, operated by Qantas New Guinea, and if it was operated by Qantas New Guinea, I'd say I'd flown it. Oh. I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah. I think it is. But quite a few of them came down were operated by Qantas. You mentioned earlier Tommy McDonald, and of course his name comes up in relation to the flying scene in far north Queensland and Cape York. Um, is there anyone else that you could think about and would say has been a, uh, a pathfinder in this area? Oh, I don't know. As, as regards a pilot or...? Mm. When you asked me that question, what did you mean by that? Did you you think of somebody else too? Oh no, I was just thinking about the men behind, because the, the pilot's not the only person concerned sure. in a... Go in on. A, in a, uh, well, you go ahead and answer the question. The pilot's not the only person concerned in something that a pilot does. He's, he's got... Right. Uh, he's got somebody that's got something... Well, in relation to the... To in relation to aerial services... Well, there's, there's quite a... And uh, uh, Graham Tanner was one of the fellows. There was Lionel Jeffries, the next policeman. And I'd say Bob Norman would be one of the uh, first pioneers of the 
that Bob came later. He he didn't he uh, he didn't start the post-war aviation in Cairns. Mm. Bob Bolton was the man that put the money up to to uh, get aviation going after the war. And I'd say, uh, without any fear of contradiction, that Frank and it'd be Lana Sugden and Dale Kenny Hutch, engineers, Frank and myself would be the ones that actually got the post-war aviation going again in Cairns. Good. And from that followed people coming in. Mm. Uh, I, w I will say this, that at, at this particular point of um, the Cairns Flying School, there was in operation the Cape York Aero Club, which Tommy McDonald, I think, was the instigator of. Are there any women in that country that stick out in your mind as being exceptional? Well, Mum Hales from Musgrove, she was one of them. Oh, Mar Gostello from, uh, from uh, Olivevale, she's another one. Mrs Taylor Cohen, she was always there to help, everything like that. Oh, there were all the women that lived in that, in that, in the uh, peninsula country, they were, they were grand people. They, I don't think people realise exactly what they put up with to live in that country. And there was always help there if you needed. There was always a bed and a cup of tea and a good feed wherever you, wherever you went. You didn't bring Dick Fry out of uh, Weeper when he crash landed somewhere, did you? No, no, that was um, Arthur Callard. But I've had my going with old Dick too. He, uh, we were going, picked him up at Cape Flattery. He wanted to go to uh, to Weeper. And at that time there was quite a lot of thunderstorm activity across the peninsula. And we left Cape Flattery and we run into a good storm of them, a good line of them. And I said to Dick, oh, might be a bit hard getting through these. He said, oh, he said, I've got to get the week. So I was all right. And we uh, went through a little bit of weather. Dick and I had a few words. Nothing serious. Anyway, we got, we eventually got through the line of thunderstorms and carried on to Weeper. And as we got past Carmen, I could see Weaver was really, oh, about 20 minutes past Cohen, I suppose, I could see that Weeper was really black. And I said to old Dick, I used to call him old Dick, I still do, he well mind. And I said to him, I said, well, look, that's Weeper straight ahead there. And I, I said, you want to get there? And he st and, uh, I said, you wanted to get there, and I said, irrespective of what's going to happen, Dick, I said, we're going to weep. And I said, I don't care whether I land this aeroplane on any beach between Vaughan Island and Norman. I said, we're going to weep. And he said, oh, he said, it looks a bit black. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. I said, we're still going to weep. And um, he said, what's going to happen? I said, I don't know, and I don't give a damn. I said, you want to get to weep? I said, we're going. I said, where we finish up? That could be anybody's guess. And he just looked at me, and that, that was it. And yeah, we finished up getting the we just beat the thing in there, and as it turned out, it was, wasn't too bad. It was quite good. And on every beach from Cairns to, uh, Cairns to uh, TI, and the uh, those five air cobras that came out there, they eventually got one out, I think. That was in Cape York, Frank and I. I forget the other chap, we went up there, we landed on the beach. 
we try to get into the air uh, cobras. Oh, it'll be back in the 1940s, 19... It'll be about 1950, somewhere around, 50, 51, 52. These are aircraft yeah. left behind by the United States Air Force? Yeah, they, 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 for, uh, they force landed on this big open... I think there were five of them there, they were quite... Because some of them were still on their wheels and everything. So we tried to get into them in years and years ago, but... Where's the location for that? Oh, it's just... Well, I just forget. We used to take a line from the bend, big bend in the... Uh, in the Jardine River, and um, there were three islands. Out of so I think one was Rain Island. All these turtles were on there. Mm -hmm. There was one, there were three islands in the row. And he used to get the three islands lined up, and that's that's where this big, well, quite of all the A and A pilots saw them, you know, that sort of thing. But we tried to get in there in about 1950, but the you know, mangroves beat us; we couldn't get in. I think Kit Thorpe was the first one in there. He was from uh, from TI. Kit went down by road and got into them. I think he's got some of the logbooks now. Kit is now. In Cairns, living in Cairns, retired from. Uh, he had his own uh, charter service in uh, TI and sold a lot, and he's living in Cairns now. I think he's got some of the original logbooks from out of the, mm. out of the aircraft. Your brother Frank lost his life on Horn Island, did he? That's right, yeah. It's what Frank, were the circumstances there? Frank and Lionel Jeffrey's boat. I don't know, I think it was just uh, a case of um, engine failure and the uh, pilot being unable to handle, can handle the asymmetric conditions of the Hudson at the time. Case of mishandling and uh, that's it. It was a survey aircraft, was it? Yeah, well, Adastri Aerial Services, Lockheed Hudson. Uh. They, they, they were a cranky sort of an aeroplane. You really had to uh, had to be on the ball with them if they uh, if you did the right thing and kept your speed up. They were quite all right. But mm. I think in this case that there's a bit of um, pilot error and uh, if that happens, well, something else happens. That that uh, wreck was left. Is it still there now? Still there, yeah, it's still there. Oh, I think it's gradually sinking into the mud. And, uh, mm. uh, when was that fatality? I mean, about 1957? 1957, I think. Was that far back? Mm. No, but after the first, after the big cyclone we had here, I think the cyclone was in 56. It was the year after the cyclone, I think, 1957. June 1957. Mm. What year were you born? 1917. Mm. And you've been retired now for several years? Four years. Four. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you're still connected with the aerial services? No, I hate them. <laughs> I hate aeroplanes. <laughs> we went for a trip over to Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. And I just abhor them. I don't like them. Although they fascinate me, the, uh, the way they operate. And I mean, the, the, the conditions we we had when we first started, and the conditions they operate under now is just absolutely fantastic. There's no guesswork. No guesswork at all. Or no luck. It's just press the right buttons, and you must get there. <laughs>